Hello, my friends, and welcome back to Monster Monday. Today, I will be embarking on this book, Morden Kanan's Tome of Foes, to explore one of the mysterious aberrations. Yes, we'll be talking about the Balhanath. Okay, guys, so the Balhanath is a uh, kind of scary creature that traces its roots back a couple editions ago, but it is an aberration, which means that it is not of this world. Now, interestingly enough, uh, as we explore the lore of aberrations in D&D, um, we'll also look at their origins and kind of compare where they come from based on different editions. Um, this creature is, is powerful. Okay, at challenge rating 11 and 5th edition, it is, it is a mighty and fearful creature. And because it has kind of specific powers and abilities, it is a naturally awesome foe for that, you know, high-level adventure or even powerful group of veteran mid-level adventurers. And I'm going to have some ideas for how you can use this, of course, but I might even surprise you with something up my sleeve, and that is I think I have figured out a clever way to use this challenge rating 11 creature, even at lower level, even for like a party of first, second, or third level. I know you're probably thinking to yourself, like, there's no way, Bill, this Belhanath would kill them. I got ideas. So let's delve into the lore, first of all. So these guys come from the Shadowfell. The idea of the Belhanath is that they build lairs and essentially trap people and, and basically use mind tricks to trap people. The idea is that, you know, imagine very limited form of telepathy that would allow a, a creature to implant mental suggestions. Um, I don't know if I'd say like hallucinations, but just like mental suggestions, subliminal suggestions um, that would lure someone to go into a place and make them believe that this place was something that it isn't, and that once in the place, then the Balhanath could snare them and take them away. So let's take a look at how these, these dudes operate, um, what their motivations are, and what their abilities are. So, uh, native to the Shadowfell, the vicious predatory Balhanath alters reality in its lair to make the place appear inviting to travelers. Once they step inside, the Balhanath springs its trap. Thanks to a limited form of telepathy, a Balhanath can sense the desires of other creatures and identify images of places where they expect those desires to be met. The Balhanath then warps reality around it, remaking its environment so that it matches the appearance of the place the creature seeks. The Balhanath never quite gets all the details right, and plenty of incongruities might give away the deception but the imitation is good enough to fool desperate creatures into stumbling into the monster's clutches. Now, before we go any further, you should note that these dudes are dumb. They have an intelligence of six. Uh, they are perceptive, instinctive perhaps, with a wisdom of 15, but not, you know, not tactical. So when we think of the Balhanath and how to use them, we can't, we can't think of them as like a criminal mastermind with a huge intelligence who's going to create this complex labyrinth of, you know, subliminal messages. Um, simple, simplicity is the secret here. And as a DM, you have to think, all right, well, what are the things that your party, your characters, or maybe an NPC who is important to the party might get lured into this lair for? What are the things? That could be like, you know, the comforts of home. It, you know, it could be the, the illusion of um, something that is needed, like a necessity. Like, you know, maybe you're in a very blighted place and there's no food or water. The Balhanath knows that the party desires this food and water and creates its lair to be attractive to them. So think about it from a simple perspective, okay? Uh, perhaps there's, you know, an NPC, like I mentioned, maybe someone who's important to the party. Instead of the party being lured into the lair, the NPC is lured into the lair, and then the party feels compelled to go rescue them. 
or to go find them. Maybe they don't even know that this lair is dangerous. They just know that their friend has disappeared. They make some, some successful investigations or survival checks, whatever. They find the tracks leading them into this location, into this area. Um, I, think, I think the other important thing to understand here too is that necessity is, is the nature of, of what they're implanting subliminally. So I don't know that it would necessarily be like possible for this Intelligence 6 Balhaneth to know, for example, to read the surface thoughts of somebody in the party and be able to pick up on their, their wants and desires. I think there's a difference, very subtle difference between wants and desires and necessities, right? So I'll just throw you an example. Say you have like a sort of selfish, greedy rogue in the party who, you know, kind of likes to loot everything and keep things for themselves. Um, I don't know if the Balhaneth would think or read the surface thoughts of that person if, um, if that person weren't actively kind of in that mode of, of selfishly collecting treasure. But maybe, you know, in an adjacent area where the adventure is taking place, the Balhanath would, would have picked up on some of these things that the desires and wants and could use those against the different members of the party or at least one member of the party to draw them in, right? So the prospect of like a cavern filled with like rare gems, for example, or maybe there's a wizard who has a lust for knowledge and just seeks like tomes of magic and scrolls. And the Balhaneth could create this subliminal message that somewhere buried underneath this ruin is a, a vault of ancient scrolls and magical tomes. And he must find, they, the wizard must find it, right? That kind of subliminal messaging is what I think the Balhaneth might be able to pick up on. In other words, not just needs like food and water or shelter, but the wants and desires that are most prominent in the party. So as a DM, this is where it gets kind of fun because you could take the Balhaneth's ability to kind of pick up those telepathic, you know, surface thoughts and, and, and create these lures for different members of the party. Um, whether that's by splitting the party or by getting uh, picking up the most, I don't want to say the leader of the party, but maybe the most active decision maker in the party um, and picking up their surface thoughts and desires and then creating that subliminal um, idea. How do you relate this though, right? So how do you as a GM, DM, how do you play the Balhaneth? How do you play without revealing your hand? In other words, you don't want to be like, um, you know, you write a note to one of the players that's like, you, you get this, you get a telepathic message from someone telling you that there's a buried vault of treasure underneath this ruin. A veteran player who maybe knows of this sort of rare uh, aberration might pick up on that and might metagame. You don't want that. You want to throw them a surprise. Um, so how do you come up with these things? Well, it's not bad to necessarily write a note in advance and slip it to a player. But when you do that at a table, if you're playing in person with people, um, everybody else in the party, all the other players pick up on that. And now whether they want to metagame or not, they know that you just handed a note to one person and that that person knows something and they're gonna, they're gonna metagame out of it. I, you know, you could have the best players at your table, but everybody's gonna be tempted, knowingly or unknowingly, to try to solve this mystery. So what's your workaround? You write a note for everyone. <laughs> like, you, so instead of one person getting the note, everybody gets a note. Now, some of these notes could just be total duds. They might have nothing to do with the Balhanath. It could just be like you, you smell something strange in the air. Or it could be um, you, you have a, a, a brief flash of a daydream, almost like deja vu, where you remember um, something about magic being close by. You, you could just make up like, you know, say you got five people. You could make up like four duds, an actual subliminal thing from the Balhanath is, is to the one person, right? Or maybe two or three of these things are subliminal messages from the Balhanath, and then a couple are duds. But the point is, is by giving 
a note to each person, you, you now have, have kind of created a little bit of meta confusion, actual confusion amongst your players, so no one knows who's special. No one knows that the other person got something important, right? Now, if they choose to share these things, then they're gonna be even more confused because your notes don't have anything to do with one another, right? If one person has the, the subliminal thing from the Balhanath that says there's a massive vault of scrolls and tomes, another person has a thing from the Balhanath that says there's a healing fountain of water that heals all cure, you know, diseases, whatever. Each one of them will have a separate note and therefore a separate vision or subliminal message. So now they, they're going to be even more confused. Point is, is that you don't want to play your hand and, sh and reveal that these are coming from a Belhanath. You want to, you want to keep things ambiguous. Uh, the other thing too, just as a DM, is that they might not take the bait. Your players might be like, this is all too sketchy. We're not doing any of these things. So the Balhanath must feed one way or the other. It's got to figure out a way to get them to go to where it needs to go. Okay. And again, if the Balhanath had like an exceptional intelligence, this would be a whole nother ball of wax. But you kind of have to keep it simple. All right, how does the Balhanath pull this out? Um, it thrives on fear and despair, taking pleasure in the horror its victims experience. It terrorizes its prey by using its reality warping powers to mask its presence until it can snatch the target. Then it teleports away to feed on its victims. That's its whole jam. Now there's a bunch of other stuff in this book which you can go buy for yourself. And you could read about the lore of, uh, you know, the Underdark and the Drow sometimes using these things as guardians. That's fine. Basically, I mean, let's be honest, any uber-powered, super smart creature or another aberration could probably use a Balhanath as a minion. That's up to you. You could flavor them in in a number of different ways, you know. Um, and in fact, you know, the, the reference to these things coming from the Shadowfell, a lot of aberrations in previous editions were, were said to have come from um, the Far Realm. Now, the Far Realm isn't mentioned here. The Balhanath are mentioned as coming from the Shadowfell, but a lot of aberrations uh, in, in previous editions were, were linked to the Far Realm, which was basically like a realm of madness, right? Which kind of fits because aberrations are not, they're, they're things that are unnatural. They have unconventional morphologies. Um, they don't fit into the natural world. So having them come from a plane of madness, you know, AKA like Cthulhu stuff, um, makes sense, right? So let's look at these dudes. Um, it, it says that in the Shadowfell, Bahanaths make their lairs near places inhabited by creatures they hunt. They typically haunt well-traveled roads and paths, snatching people who come along. A Balhanath has been captured and exploited by drow might lair in caves near underdark passages and guard the ways in and out of a drow enclave. That description makes me think of these as lazy creatures who wait for their prey to come to them and then when they're when it's convenient and safe they trick them in a little bit closer, nab them, teleport away and then rum, 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 eat them, right? Uh, kind of like my bearded dragon. It's a very lazy creature. Just waits for the crickets to come by and then, you know, rah. Um, instead of being like an active hunter who's moving around. That's fine. You could play this by the book. Um, but and, and again, I don't think of them as being a cunning hunter because they have an intelligence of six. So you could play this by the book, or you could come up with your own reason of why a Belhanath would be in the region where your game is set. Instead of moving your party to an Underdark campaign, or moving them to the Shadowfell, like I don't even, I don't think I've ever even played in a game where we went into the Shadowfell. And I've been playing this game for over 40 years. So um, you don't have to follow this book. You don't have to set it in the Shadowfell or, or in the Underdark. It could be in the port city of blah, blah, blah that's in your campaign. Doesn't really matter. Maybe the Balhanath came from one place because it was summoned by some 
whack job wizard who then got like eaten by the Balhanath and the Balhanath just decided to stick around. And now it lives in the wine cellar of an abandoned uh, tavern. And it just grabs, you know, passerbys and homeless people, whatever. Point is, is that like, it's, it's kind of a lazy dude and it's waiting for its victims to come through and then it plays its little mind tricks and it traps them. What's cool is that it's got some mad lair actions. So let's check those out. When fighting inside its lair, a Balhanath can use lair actions. On initiative count 20, a Balhanath can take one lair action to cause one of the following effects. The Balhanath can't use the same lair action two rounds in a row. Um, lair action number one. The Balhanath warps reality around it in an area up to 500 square feet. After 10 minutes, the terrain in the area reshapes to assume the appearance of a location sought by one intelligent creature whose mind the Balhanath has read. The transformation affects non-living material only and can't create anything with moving parts or magical properties. Any object created in this area is, upon closer inspection, revealed as a fake. Books are filled with empty pages. Golden items are obvious counterfeits, and so on. The transformation lasts until the Balhanath dies or uses this lair action again. That is a powerful illusory uh, effect, okay? Powerful. So let's remember that because that's one of the tricks up my sleeve that I'm going to use, even if you want to scale this dude down to low level or mid-level. All right. Uh, the Balhanath targets one creature within 500 feet of it. The target must succeed on a DC 16 saving throw, wisdom save, or the target, along with whatever it's wearing and carrying, teleports to an unoccupied space of the Balhanath's choice within 60 feet of it. Keep that in mind as well. The Balhanath targets one creature within 500 feet of it. The target must succeed on a DC 16 wisdom save, or the Balhanath becomes invisible to that creature for one minute. This effect ends if the Balhanath attacks the target. Those are lair actions. Regional effects. A region containing a Balhanath's lair becomes warped by the creature's unnatural presence, which creates one or more of the following effects. Creatures within one mile of the Balhanath's lair experience a sensation of being close to whatever they desire most. The sensation grows stronger the closer the creatures come to the Balhanath's lair. The Balhanath can sense the strongest desires of any humanoid within one mile of it and learns whether the, those desires involve a place, a safe location to rest, a temple, home, or somewhere else. If the Balhanath dies, these effects end immediately. Um, <laughs> so, so here's my idea, right? At, at high level, these dudes are awesome. And again, break the rules. Put them wherever you need them to be. They could be in a dungeon. They could be in ruins. They could be in a city, in the sewers. They could be in a variety of different places. Caves, uh, maybe an abandoned pyramid. I don't know. Um, but the point is, is that they, they do hunger. So having them in the middle of nowhere where there's no passerbys doesn't logistically work because they need people to come within their range and lure them in. Um, could they be hiding out in a bog or a swamp that's adjacent to a major road, uh, a, like a major travel route, trade route? Yes, that could work. Could they be in a frozen Arctic area? Yes, as long as there were people who came through that area enough, frequently enough. Okay, here's the thing. Mystery is the key. People shouldn't know that this is a Balhanath. There could be rumors about ghosts, hauntings, you know, specters, poltergeists, whatever. People that go missing and never appear. Whatever you want. You, you want to keep the identity of this creature from being revealed until it's encounter time. So, how can we use this at high level? I would say straight out of the book. You use it as is, wherever you want, and you go full blast. You might even be thinking, well, at challenge rating 11, um, and it has like legendary resistance, it has, you know, a pretty fierce bite attack, it can vanish, it can teleport, all these different things. Um, maybe one of these is enough. Well, that depends, I guess, on the power of your high level party. So 
Balhanas traditionally aren't uh, like communal. They're they're pretty much not communal. Uh, they do mate. Um, if if memory serves, this isn't even in the book. I had to look it up online. But like they mate asexually. They intertwine their 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 tentacles and they mate. And then they have like an egg that is hatched like a year later or something like that. Um, and then it takes like three years for them to mature. So. If you needed to throw in a little more Balhanath muscle against a high-level group, I suppose you could. You could just have it be that two Balhanath have joined together for mating at the time when the party encounters them, and now you got two of them instead of one to worry about. And maybe they're hungry because they're mating, and they, they want to feed their, their own needs as well as have some reserve of food for their hatchling when it comes along, what have you. For mid-level, one of these is pretty pretty much enough. And you might even judge that you need to scale it down a little bit in terms of its intensity. Maybe take away the legendary resistance if it's mid-level. Maybe lower its hit points and lower its bite attack. Um, or take away one of the lair actions. You know, that's, that's all plausible scaling. Um, but now, here's the cool part. Here's where I share with you an idea for an adventure thread that you can use these in. So I mentioned previously like the idea that a Balhanath would be in a city. So imagine you have a city in your campaign. It could be a port city, regular city, whatever. Um, and the Balhanath, like I said, was brought to this plane by some insane summoner who then perished in his own madness or the Balhanath ate him and, you know, whatever, okay? So the Bahanath now is in this city. Uh, it has, you know, basically turned the tower of the wizard or a local building or the house of the wizard, whatever, into its lair. Um, and it maybe it lives in the cellar, but it draws people in, right? Because as people pass by, it creates these, you know, mental suggestions and it draws people in, and that's how it has a pretty tidy sum of of food. Um, and as it has established itself, there are more regional effects. Um, but rumors in a city are also abound, you know, about the haunted wizard's tower and that anybody who goes in often doesn't come back. Um, maybe this is what draws in um, a group of adventurers, mid-level adventurers, to explore this wizard's tower. And maybe the Balhanath recognizes in someone in the party that they have a desire for magical objects or magical lore or whatever it is, and they start implanting those things. Um, and maybe, maybe they're drawn into the tower to a specific place, and the party's kind of split up. And one by one, the Balhanath kind of goes and captures and grabs these members of the party and teleports down to the basement level, uh, and then, you know, snares them up um, instead of maybe outright just eating them, maybe there's a pit. Maybe the Balhana throws them in this pit that it has. And, uh, and you know, you can make it like a 40-foot pit. So the, the mid-level party, you know, has to figure out a way to get out of this pit. Um, and maybe the Balhana, you know, rips their, their backpack and their equipment off of them as it has them grappled and throws them in the pit afterwards. So they don't have rope, they don't have weapons, whatever. Um, you could also, by the way, adapt this for a low-level group. Now, here's what I'll say about the low-level group concept. You, have, you create this mystery about the wizard's house or the wizard's tower and people disappearing. You have the low-level group investigate it, right? And maybe even the Balhanath, uh, you have an NPC with the low-level group and the Balhanath lures the NPC in and takes the NPC, and the group hears their NPC friend scream from below. Now, they can either fight or flight, right? If they're a flight kind of group, they're like, let's get the hell out of here, and they go ask for reinforcements, and this is where you bring in a group of NPCs that are higher level who are gonna come with the low level group and help them figure out what's happened. And maybe they defeat the Balhanath. Um, or the low-level group is like, let's go help our friend. They, they find the secret door to the cellar. They run downstairs. They see the Balhanath. 
and it, it, you know, you do something horrifying, right? Like think Cthulhu horror level thing where like maybe the Balhanath's tentacles like literally rip their NPC friend in half. And then it turns and it opens its mouth and it, it ah, you know, and, and you could kit bash this if you don't want to kill the low level party, um, have the Balhanath teleport away or have it turn invisible or, you know, have it do, uh, an attack that doesn't exist here. Give it a, a layer action that causes fear and be like, all right, everybody make a uh, wisdom save DC 21. They're all going to fail. They're all going to run away. But then after the fear effect runs off, maybe they try to go back. The thing's gone. And now they tell, you know, the constables or some local heroes, some champions of the city, whatever. Why do that, though? Why do that at a low-level thing? Because this could be a seed. It could be an adventure that they're not meant to kill the big bad end guy. They're meant, this is like an introduction. And the Balhanath isn't even the big bad end guy. They're just starting to understand that there are greater, deeper, scarier things out there. If that's the jam that you're looking for in your campaign. And if not, just use these guys for mid or high level stuff and take advantage of the fact that their, you know, mind tricks are going to be a fun tool that you can use to kind of engage your, your party. Um, and ultimately your party will be disappointed when they find that there, there aren't magical tomes and scrolls or, you know, mountains of gold and diamonds, but, you know, it's just a collection of bones and junk that the Balhanath has discarded over decades. So that's, that's Aberration Balhanath. Um, if you have encountered these things in your games, or if you have used them as a GM or DM, put that, uh, share your story in the comments below. I like to read these, and so do the members of the community. Until next time, we'll see you. Peace out. Today, I f my life. Oh, all right. Oh my God. This is the longest video ever. Go to black. Well, hello, it's me, Wizzy. I'm back once again to remind you to subscribe and click on the notifications button and also watch videos that are over there. And then don't forget to tune in to the next episode of whatever show you are just watching and crafting videos and DM tips and pro tips for vlogging and all sorts of gaming things. And also you could watch Bill eat food and watch other shows featuring Bill. He made me say that because he's a narcissist. Okay, bye.